Hi, I'm Neil Garfield. I'm the editor of www.livinglies.wordpress.com, the leading blog resource for foreclosure defense on the internet. Today we're going to talk about steps toward freedom. And before I do that, let me remind you that the information contained in any of my materials, including this video, is general information and you should consult with competent legal licensed counsel where you are going to make a decision about what action to take. In the event that you hear anything on my materials, my videos, or the books, or the blog that conflicts with advice that you are receiving from competent legal licensed counsel local to the property in which you are involved, then you should always take the advice of the attorney with whom you, you have consulted. So let's talk about the steps towards freedom and how that has evolved as a strategy on the Living Lies blog, basically taking the information that I've received back from attorneys, pro se litigants, bankers, real estate brokers, and other people. These steps towards freedom are taken from the feedback that I have received from people who have utilized the strategies of the Garfield Continuum in connection bo with both court actions and non-court actions. Uh, I've gotten feedback, wonderful feedback, from lawyers, from pro se litigants, real estate brokers, and bankers and a number of other people. And I've boiled down the steps that I think are appropriate to the following. First is getting your information together. There's an intake form on the blog, which I recommend that you use, and it's free which requires you to fill in a lot of information that any lawyer or any forensic auditor or any expert is going to ask you for anyway. Second, you need to collect documents. There are many different types of documents that may be required and sometimes it varies from one case to another. Generally speaking, if you are familiar with the intake form and familiar with real estate transactions, you might not need any help collecting your data and your information. If you do, there is a service on the Living Lies store, www.livinglies-store.com, which will provide backup support for you to talk to a live person in getting your information together. Now remember these people are just to, to assist you in clerical tasks. They are not lawyers. They are not accountants. They are not forensic auditors. They are just customer service people who generally know what to ask you for and how to help you in getting your information together. After you've gotten your information together and after you've assembled your documents, then you need to locate a forensic analyst or a TILA auditor or somebody who can review your documentation and help you prepare a qualified written request under the Real Estate Settlement and Procedures Act or a debt validation letter or both so that you can direct questions which 
really seek in the case of securitized residential home loans, they seek two answers. Who's my creditor and how much do I owe, if anything? And you will find that most of the time the answers you get are at best evasive. Many times there is no answer. But it's important that you follow through with these particular steps in order to establish your footprints in the sand because you're going to be taking potentially further steps. Then the next thing you need to do is to have an expert. Now, the expert could be a lawyer, it could be an accountant, it could be a real estate expert, it could be a mortgage expert. Review all of your data, all of your documents, and the report of the forensic analyst or TILA auditor and issue an expert declaration or affidavit that describes your loan, describes the securitization process, assuming your loan was securitized, and in most cases it will have been, and comes to certain conclusions and opinions regarding the status of your loan, the status of your obligation, the status of your note, the status of your mortgage or deed of trust. This will assist in your next step, whether you are a pro se litigant or you're going to a lawyer. I do recommend very strongly that you seek the services of an attorney. I know that when I began my work more than two years ago, I was encouraging many people in their pro se litigation. Things have evolved to the point where the pretender lenders, the non-creditors who are seeking to collect on the note or foreclose on the mortgage, have become more sophisticated in their responses, both procedurally and substantively. I think that most people who would seek to be pro se litigants are going to find that they're in over their heads without the assistance of an attorney. So I strongly recommend that you do go to an attorney. And this attorney will seek to use the expert declaration and all the other information that you've gathered in order to, if necessary, get a temporary restraining order or otherwise stop any action by the uh, servicer or pretender lender or whoever the participant in the securitization chain is that is seeking to collect or enforce or foreclose uh, in your situation. Now remember, this information applies not only to people who are in foreclosure, but for people who are current in their payments and are considering what to do about the fact that the value of the property has gone down so substantially that they may never see the light of day again. In other words, those underwater mortgages where the amount owed on the note vastly exceeds the true value of the property. And frankly, if you really look at the true value of the property on sale in terms of what the proceeds would be after a real estate broker takes their fee and after all the other expenses, you'll find that the number that is estimated out there 
about people underwater is probably two to three times what the published estimates are. I would say there's probably around 12 or 13 million homes in uh, the United States alone uh, where people are either at the break-even point or underwater. And according to the most recent studies, when people are in a status where the value of their home is less than 75% of what they owe, they are looking seriously at the possibility of just walking from the home. So let me talk a little bit about that option, uh, which is clearly gaining momentum in the marketplace. For those people who have a $300,000 mortgage and the house is only worth $160,000 and they've perhaps gone through the what I call bogus modification process at most servicers, which results in nothing happening or a modification that is temporary and results in foreclosure anyway six months later, they are looking at the, the prospect of simply renting a house for perhaps half or less than the monthly payment being demanded of them for the ownership of the house that they're in. And considering the number of foreclosures and the number of uh, people who have taken a hit on their FICO scores as a result of this recession, it is probably true that while there is a hit on the FICO score, it may not be as important as it once was uh, to see a foreclosure. Whether or not you decide to walk or to fight is, of course, your decision. I certainly would like to see you stay in your home and fight it out because I think that's what's best for our society in general. And I think it's what's best probably for you if you didn't have to move. But it's a personal decision and a legal decision, and you should consult with the appropriate people before you make it. So assuming that you decide to stay in the house, and to fight to stay in the house, uh, if necessary, then you're going to seek a temporary restraining order. You might file a bankruptcy action, which results in an automatic stay and prevents them from going forward until they lift that stay. And it's in the motion to lift stay, just like the motion for temporary restraining order, that the issues are joined as to whether or not these people have the legal standing or the right to be proceeding against you at all. And on the blog, you'll see that there have been numerous decisions, including one recent one from Vermont, where the judge brought it up himself without there being a motion from the homeowner and basically said that the party in that case MERS, Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems, didn't have the right to be bringing any kind of foreclosure action, and he vacated the foreclosure that he had previously granted and said that if the proper plaintiff ever wants to step forward, that they can do so, but that MERS was neither the beneficiary nor the creditor and therefore had no right to be in court. And that's true for servicers and all of these other people who are in the securitization chain. Your creditor in all probability is an investor, which is a pension fund or a sovereign wealth fund that purchased certificates of asset-backed securities. And in that purchase, they received a promise to pay 
and a conveyance of a percentage interest in a pool of mortgages that presumably included yours. Now the question is, are they the creditors or is it the federal government through the bailouts or through the AIG payments on the insurance to Goldman Sachs and uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, Chase, etc. The fact that there are third-party payments which did occur in connection with these mortgages leads to a question of fact. And your objective and your lawyer's objective is at the beginning not to get the judge to agree that you're right and the other side's wrong. Your objective is to get the judge to agree that there is a question of fact that needs to be decided by an evidentiary hearing. If there is a credible question of fact as to who the creditor is and how much is owed and whether third-party payments were made, then the judge will, in most cases, allow you to proceed in discovery and allow you to proceed towards an evidentiary hearing. This, in turn, will most likely lead to a settlement, modification, or mediation of your obligation, your transaction, in which you receive a substantial principal reduction on the amount owed under the mortgage and a substantial change in the terms of the mortgage such that you get a low fixed rate for 30 years. This is not going to happen like magic, and they will, in most cases, as I have seen so far, fight harder and harder to prevent you from getting to that point. But I'll say this, there are investors who are getting the message that the intermediaries, the servicers, and the other parties who are bringing these foreclosure actions and doing these modifications are doing so against the interests of the investors, the, the real creditors. And so these intermediaries, the servicers, are acting against the interests of both the debtor, who's the homeowner, and the creditor, who's the investor, who put up the money. So those are your steps towards freedom. When I say freedom, you might end up with a free and clear house. It's happened several hundred times in connection with several of these transactions. You might end up uh, with a modified mortgage and you might end up losing. Let's remember that the knee-jerk reaction of any judge is going to be that if a borrower is in front of him seeking to delay or in some way block a foreclosure action, his assumption is going to be that there's a legitimate debt that the borrower is trying to avoid using tricks of the trade or sleight of hand or procedural uh, gimmicks. It's up to you and your attorney to show that you're looking for the truth and you're looking for your real creditor so that you can effectively speak to that creditor, modify or settle your mortgage, settle your claims regarding predatory loans, and spread the risk of the loss that happened as a result of the mortgage meltdown 
between the investor, the borrower, and all these people in between the investment banks that created the mess in the first place. Thank you. Uh, of this, tell me when. Remember this in terms of procedure. If you are in a non-judicial state and you have received a notice, you are already in a state of emergency because usually the state provides you with a very short window of opportunity to contest the sale of your property. If you are in a judicial state, then you have a certain amount of time, for example, in Florida, 20 days if you're an in-state resident, 30 days if you're out of state, in which to file responsive pleadings. Your responsive pleading may be a motion to dismiss, a motion to strike, or a motion uh, for more definite statement. Uh, it might be uh, a number of things that you may want to pursue through your attorney. But you must answer or file some response of pleading, affirmative defenses, counterclaim, within the time set forth on the summons that you received in a judicial state. So either way, whether you're in a non-judicial state or you're in a judicial state, the thing you must do is act and react and take control of the narrative before they already have sold your house and they've already initiated eviction proceedings against you. Not that those things can't be reversed, but in all probability, you want to take the earliest possible action you can to stop the foreclosure in its tracks.